administered program by the Federal Reserve and, and partially by the Treasury. And it's all done by ex-Wall Street people and current Wall Street people. And, uh, you know, the ordinary people really don't have any input into any of this. Uh, and a great example of how uh, Wall Street has actually risen in influence is this new program that Timothy Geithner introduced the other day, which is really just state-subsidized uh, hedge fund profiteering. Uh, they're actually, the government is actually going to be lending a trillion dollars to hedge funds uh, so that they can invest in these securities, and they're going to uh, basically guarantee that they can't really lose any money in these investments. Uh, it's sort of a, you know, a heads-I-win, tails-the-taxpayer-loses situation. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really bad situation for ordinary Socializing people. Socializing the debt and privatizing the profit. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you write in your piece, in 1997 and 1998, so like 10 years ago, the years leading up to the passage of Phil Graham's fateful act that gutted Glass-Steagall, the banking, brokerage, and insurance industries spent $350 million right. on political contributions and lobbying. Graham alone, then the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, collected $2.6 million in five years. Right. The law passed not close. 90 to 8, you say, in the Senate, with the support of 38 Democrats, including some names that might surprise you, you write. Joe Biden, John Kerry, Tom Daschle, Dick Durbin, even John Edwards. Right. Right. I think one of the things that people don't understand about this crisis is they, there's, we always have this instinct in America to blame one side or the other for any political problem. We, you know, the you know, people on the left want to say, oh, it's George Bush did it. And on the right, they always want to say it was Clinton. Well, this is as purely a bipartisan pr problem as we've ever had in this country. This was uh, absolute, uh, you know, unity on, on both, uh, in the part of both parties. They both were absolutely complicit in passing these deregulatory moves. You know, in the, in the instance of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, that was sponsored by Phil Graham and by the Republicans, but it was uh, very, very uh, uh, enthusiastically supported by Robert Rubin and Larry Summers, and it was signed into law by Bill Clinton and passed with the support of all those very powerful Democratic senators. And this continued to be the case throughout the, you know, the late 90s and throughout this whole decade. And that's, that's why we're in this, in this situation right we are right now, because nobody's really, you know, representing the other side. Goldman Sachs, it turns out, was Cassano's largest customer. That's right. What does that mean? Well, uh, the insurance policies, the, the, the things that you know, Cassano was selling that are like insurance, Goldman Sachs actually uh, had bought $20 billion worth of those guarantees, so that when we bailed out AIG, we were effectively bailing out Goldman Sachs because AIG owed Goldman Sachs uh, $20 billion. And, which is, and that's significant because who was the Treasury Secretary who engineered this bailout? It was Hank Paulson, who was the former head of Goldman Sachs. Uh, they ultimately ended up installing Ed Liddy as the CEO of, Go of uh, AIG, and Liddy himself is a former uh, Goldman employee. Uh, and now the top aide to Timothy Geithner, Mark Patterson, is a former Goldman executive. I mean, the, 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 this whole situation is rife with Goldman Sachs employees. So what happened to Cassano? Cassano made $280 million. Uh, he was, uh, when he was forced out of AIG last year, he was given a $34 million severance payment. He was allowed to stay on. Uh, at a salary of a million dollars a month, and in fact, he kept uh, earning that salary even after AIG was bailed out for at least another month. Uh, and he's now living in London, and as far as I know, that's the consequence for Joe Cassano. He made almost $300 million, and now he's living in a big, lavish townhouse not far from Harrods in London, and that's it. That's the end of the story. Uh, a friend was asking this question the other day. Uh, the House passed the legislation saying tax 90 percent of whatever right. these bonuses are if they don't return them. But first of all, who are these people in the London office? Are they British? They wouldn't be subjected to the IRS. And if they're Americans, how, how does tax laws work for Americans abroad? You know, I, I don't really know, honestly. I mean, AIGFP uh, has two offices. They have one that's in Greenwich, Connecticut, and one that's in London. Uh, I'm assuming most of these employees are Americans. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the key thing about that whole taxation issue is that it's not even necessary. This is a situation where Timothy Geithner and Ben Bernanke could have called, you know, AIG CEO Ed Liddy on the phone and said, hey, look, take those bonuses back or you're going to be floating face down in the Hudson River tomorrow. Uh, the, we know it, it's not necessary to go through a congressional act. The United States now owns 80 percent of AIG. We can basically do whatever we want. 
the fact that we had to, to, to resort to those measures is, is extraordinary in itself. The head, the former CEO of AIG, Hank Greenberg, what did he understand of these uh, credit default swaps, and how did AIG go from insurance to CDSs? Well, from what I understand, Greenberg didn't really understand these instruments at all, and that's one of the big problems, is that nobody understood them. The only people who understood these, these uh, CDSs and these derivative instruments was the people who were actually writing these contracts and this is a tiny tiny unit again it's 377 people within a company of over 150,000 employees and basically they were making so much money that AIG senior management said oh you know great as long as you tell us everything's fine we're you know we're cool with that and they never really did any aggressive accounting uh, of AIG FP and they never really questioned any of the math that Joe Cassano was sending upstairs you compare this whole thing to a casino. Lay out the analogy for us. Well, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, situation is, uh, you know, a lot of these, these contracts, these CDS contracts, are, are, are like gambling in the sense that um, uh, normally when you buy an insurance policy, you're buying a policy on a house that you actually own. Uh, with these CDS contracts, you could actually bet on somebody else's mortgage. Uh, AIG, for instance, could have gone to Goldman Sachs and, and said, you know, we'd like to bet that, you know, the mortgages that were issued by J.P. Morgan Chase are go going to default in the next 10 years. So these two parties that don't have anything to do uh, with the actual underlying loan can actually gamble on the outcome of that loan. Uh, so this is, it's really no different at all from gambling, and that's why they had to seek a specific exemption from gaming laws uh, in, the year, in the year 2000 when they actually went forward with the deregulation of these instruments. What do you mean? In, in the Commodity Futures Modernization Act in the year 2000, they specifically exempted credit default swaps from being uh, treated as gaming uh, under any state laws. And that's that they had to do that because they were afraid that they were going to be regulated by, uh, you know, state gaming agencies. Matt Taibbi, who won, who lost? Well, I think, you know, everybody loses in the financial crisis, and this is obviously an enormous, you know, uh, downfall for everybody financially, but I think that the Wall Street crowd really actually won politically in the end because what we're seeing now is that they're, they're now having an influence over budgetary policy and, and they're able to, to um, get their hooks not only into our money but into the money of the Federal Reserve and, and the Treasury uh, and they're really rising in influence because of that. Is this about restoring Wall Street to the way it was? I mean, you say uh, Wall Street insiders are using the bailout to stage a revolution. Are they succeeding? I just think we're entering into unprecedented territory, you know, because of the way the bailout was, was engineered. We've essentially created a giant holding company uh, with the government as, as senior management. Uh, we now own controlling stakes in, in uh, an enormous variety of companies, a dying insurance giant, AIG. We, we've uh, absorbed all these toxic instruments, so we're now the world's largest hedge fund and the world's riskiest hedge fund. We've bought part of auto finance companies and uh, credit card companies. And so we've created this enormous and enormously complex holding company, and the only people who really understand how to administer that company are these uh, Wall Street insiders uh, and, and the ex-Wall Street insiders who are now in the administration. And because the rest of us don't really understand this stuff, uh, you know, they've essentially increased their political power because they've created a, a, a political system that's too complex for ordinary people to understand. Do people really feel confident when they say Wall Street has rallied, like when Timothy Geithner yesterday uh, announced his $1 trillion no. dollar plan? The only Does that reason, help The mainstream? only reason that Wall Street rallied yesterday was because this plan that Geithner administered is such an enormous giveaway to Wall Street. Uh, it's essentially, you know, a, a again, it's state-subsidized hedge fund profiteering and of course every hedge fund in the world was uh, you know throwing a party at the news that Geithner uh, came out with this plan yesterday. Matt Taibbi I want to thank you for being with us contributing editor for Rolling Stone magazine his latest article The Big Takeover and he's written a number of books his latest The Great Derangement a terrifying true story of war politics and religion. This is Democracy Now! democracynow.org the war and peace report as we move now to the border. Secretary